Good afternoon, Paradox, and thank you for having me. Uh, thank you to Pastor Craig and Pastor Mandy for the invitation, and I would also like to thank Twitter for making the world so much smaller. Uh, if it wasn't for Twitter, I probably would have never known about Paradox um, or known about Pastor Craig, and so thank you, Twitter, for helping even in COVID times to connect us all. Um, I was invited to share with you all today about theology that honors black women or what is more widely known um, in theological circles as womanist theology. The primary text that I'm going to draw from today uh, is Genesis 16 and this narrative about an Egyptian slave woman, slave woman uh, Abraham and Sarah, two key people in the biblical narrative. And this text is one that womanist theologians and scholars have drawn upon for decades. So it's really the core of womanism and the core of what a theology that honors black women starts with. Um, so today we'll take some time to explore womanism and a womanist reading of scripture. And I invite you all to open your hearts and minds um, as I share our way uh, that I approach scripture personally. Uh, this is a very personal practice for me um, when I'm looking at the biblical text. And so before we get started, though, I want to share a few things about the way I approach the biblical text. Uh, the first thing is that I come to the text aware that centuries of biblical interpretation has been dominated, dominated by people who don't look like me. Uh, interpretations of the Bible stories have been popularized and perpetuated by the communities in power. Uh, the stories in scripture as we know them are bent in favor of the powerful patriarchal majority culture. So I always seek when reading scripture to mine beneath the obvious, which will always tell us the story that glorifies the powerful and to see the story there that empowers the powerless. Uh, the second way that I approach the biblical text is that no matter what anyone says, I am aware that it is impossible for us to read scripture objectively. And honestly, I don't want to read scripture objectively. Uh, when we read scripture and ask certain, certain questions of scripture, we do that based off of where we stand. I stand in a social location as an African American woman from a working class family who is now college educated, um, has a higher level degree and has a career and would now be considered middle class. And so all of those things from race to gender to um, socioeconomic status, all of those things and all of those experiences are lenses through which I am looking at scripture and my lens is different than yours, but that does not mean either lens is wrong. The questions that you ask of scripture are not invalid. And just because there isn't a book or a preacher or some source that tells us that, that or that isn't asking the same questions doesn't mean that we shouldn't be asking these questions. So I encourage you all to ask lots of questions with me as we're exploring the text today. And lastly, I always approach the text asking to grasp something new about the divine and the nature of the divine. I've personally come to stop looking for meaning um, in scripture or more so I have stopped looking for the meaning of a text or what the scripture is saying. Instead, I approach asking the spirit to open my eyes and heart to a new way of seeing God and myself differently through this text. Um, it opens me up with curiosity so that I can approach these narratives without looking to get something or looking to get a particular message, um, looking to prove a point, but I'm looking because I'm curious. And so I invite you all to be curious with me today. Um, so 
Before we get started, uh, let's pray as I invite the creative spirit to create something beautiful within us. Divine Spirit, I thank you for this opportunity to be curious together in community, albeit a virtual community, but in community nonetheless. And so as we ask questions and explore and listen, uh, may you create something beautiful today, something that is life-giving not only for us, but for others. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. So um, the quest before us today is to be introduced uh, to and to understand a theology that honors black women. Womanism is one of the many theologies that fit into the category of theology from the margins. While it's unfortunate that it's considered marginal to do theology with an inclusive lens, womanism is a way of doing theology that has helped me to find continued value in the biblical text, even though I would not consider myself particularly religious or Christian in the traditional sense. So what is womanism? Dr. Will Gaffney, a womanist theologian and professor of Hebrew Bible at Bright Divinity School in Fort Worth, Texas, gives a very thorough definition in the introduction to her book, Womanist Midrash, and reintroduction, reintroduction to the women of the Torah and the throne. And so in her introduction, which I'm going to read some portions of to you, uh, her introduction gives a very thorough definition of what womanism is. And it actually is drawn from the creative work of Alice Walker. Um, and Alice Walker defines, has several different aspects that define womanism. Uh, but the one that some things that are interesting, uh, from her definition are womanism is from womanish, a black feminist or feminist of color. Uh, it is responsible, in charge, serious. Uh, it is also a description of a woman who loves other women sexually and or non-sexually. It appreciates and prefers women's culture, women's emotional flexibility, and women's strength. It is committed to the survival and wholeness of the entire people, male and female. And womanist is to feminist as purple is to lavender. So that, that last part really speaks to the richness of womanism um, and the layers and aspects of that. So Dr. Gaffney says that most simply, womanism is black women's feminism. It distinguishes itself from the dominant culture feminism, which is all too often distorted by racism and classism and marginalizes womanism, womanist, and women of color. Women, womanism emerged as black women's intellectual and interpretive response to racism and classism and feminism, and its articulation and in response to sexism and black liberationist thought. So it is operative in religious and non-religious literary disciplines. And it is complex now in its third and more fourth wave, troubling its ancestral gender, ethnic, and religious categories. So womanism is often changing and evolving, but it is one that is inclusive of the experience of black women. It centers black women thought and it is intersectional in the way that it views women because it takes into account race, gender, social economic status, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity. It takes into account all of that. Womanists and feminists ask very different questions of a text than do other readers and different questions from each other. Uh, privilege, privileging the crossroads between our Afro-diasporic identity and our gender, we ask questions about power, authority, voice, agency, hierarchy, inclusion, and exclusion. In womanist practice, the voice and perspective of the whole community is sought and valued. Womanist interpretation does not privilege the embodiment 
in experiences of black women at the expense of other members of the interpretive community. Rather, while affirming the value of for other readers, womanist interpretation makes room at the table of discourse for the perspectives of the least privileged among the community and the honored guests of any background. Womanism courts the voices of those around the table without regard to race, ethnicity, gender, age, ability, orientation, or trans or cis embodiment. Womanism is committed to the wholeness and flourishing of the whole community. And knowing that, that is a theology that speaks to me in a time where uh, primary Christian theologies have been so harmful to the the lives and the embodiment of various peoples, of various abilities, of various gender identities, of various sexual orientations, of various races. Uh, womanism is here and it speaks to bringing everyone to the table and each person at the table having a valued voice. And it's almost as if it's a table of home. And I just love that image because it is an amazing way to look at scripture, as we'll do in just a few minutes. Uh, there are some questions and some primary principles of womanism that shape the text uh, and some questions that someone reading from a womanist lens might ask are, where are the women and girls? What are they doing? And what are their names? Who is speaking and who is active in this narrative? What are the power dynamics in this narrative? What are the ethical implications of the text when read from the perspective of the dominant character or characters? How have Black women historically related to this text? In what ways do the contemporary circumstances of Black women readers shape new and renewed interpretations? How does or can this text function as scripture for Black women? And another interesting question is who is, or what is the construction of God in the text? Is she, he, or it invested in the flourishing of Black women, our families, and our worlds? And so some principles to keep in mind. I know I'm going really quickly through this and it seems like a lot, but once we look at the text, you'll really see how this comes out almost naturally once we start to ask questions. And so, some principles that shape the text are the legitimacy of Black women's biblical interpretation as normative and authoritative, the inherent value of each member of a community in the text and interpreting the text, talking back to the text, so giving some response and engaging deeply with the text, and making it plain, the work of exegesis from translation to interpretation. And so, that is the framework that we are approaching the text today, the text of Genesis 16. And so in this context, let's take a look at that chapter, at the story of Hagar, and keep in mind some of these questions and principles that are guiding the text. Um, so I'm reading from the English Standard Version of uh, Genesis chapter 16. It says, Starting at verse one, it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my, oh, I skipped a verse, sorry. And when he went into Hagar, she conceived. And when she saw that he had, she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. 
May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur, and he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from, and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring, so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant, and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Bier Laharoi. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar, Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. This passage and the rest of Hagar's story found in Genesis 21, 8-20 are the only texts in the canon of scripture that mention Hagar, the Egyptian handmaiden and slave woman of Sarai, wife of Abram. But who was Hagar? The text tells us nothing about her parents. It tells us nothing about what her life was like back in Egypt or even the circumstances that led her to be in the social location she was in when we meet her in the text. If we're honest, we don't even know her real name. The name in our Bibles, Hagar, is directly translated as the alien or the stranger. Did it happen that somehow, like my black ancestors, Hagar's name was changed upon enslavement? That not only did she lose her freedom and become the property of Sarai, but she also lost the one thing that connected her to her true identity and to her people. Whatever the situation of Hagar before we meet her here or her real name, all we know is that Hagar is an Egyptian woman and that she is now the property of Sarai. She is an economic underling. And in this text, she is traditionally considered powerless. This text in its traditional reading will have us demonize Hagar and elevate Sarai because the focus of the biblical narrative as a whole is on the line that leads to the Messiah. So Hagar's story, when read from the lens of the dominant culture, of the dominant narrative, her story is merely marginal. But when we are looking at the text through a womanist lens, we're able to see that this, this encounter between Sarai and Hagar and Abram are all part of a very interesting under narrative going on while this Abraham narrative is going above. So while traditionally we would read this with very little thought to Hagar, it's also important that when we're looking at this that we don't demonize Sarai as the opposite. So although she's a woman with privilege, she is still a barren woman in a patriarchal society. And thus, as a barren woman in a society that determines her worth not only by her attachment to her husband, but also by the son she births, while Sarai is a privileged woman in this narrative, she is a woman without honor. So, in an attempt to restore her honor and worth in the eyes of society, she decides that her young slave woman would be the right choice to birth her children. Hagar's lack of agency is reflected, again, in the fact that nowhere in this exchange do we ever hear anything from Hagar. Never at any point are Hagar's dreams and desires considered. Like African-American ancestors in the Americas, 
Hagar was no more than property. They were property that had to produce other property. Whether it was forced breeding of slaves attempting to match the strongest men with the strongest women to produce the strongest slave children, or the way in which slave masters over-sexualized the black woman's body, using it to fulfill his desires through rape, Hagar was sexually exploited for the benefit, and dare I say the profit, of the powerful family that owned her. But something changed in Hagar when she conceived. The text says that she looked on Sarai with a contempt, or she began to look down on Sarai. And I kind of challenge this idea, because could it be that knowing how the narrative always glorifies the powerful, the language of contempt on the part of Hagar was used to tell a certain narrative and also make us believe a little less about Hagar? Could it be that Hagar did not begin to think less of Sarai, but that she began to think more of herself? Could it be that getting pregnant showed Hagar she was more than just a slave woman? Could it be that for the first time she was more than an alien, more than a stranger? I mean, is it not common for people in power to feel offended when the powerless and the marginalized begin to see themselves as worthy of dignity and equal power? It was not uncommon for slaves who stepped beyond their position to be knocked back down to size by the master or mistress of the plantation. Sarai was infuriated at the ability of her slave woman to do something she could not. She was offended by how the power dynamic in her home shifted now that Hagar was not just a concubine, but her pregnancy moved her to the position of a wife. She was upset that Hagar would begin to see herself as anything more than a powerless slave. The Bible says that Sarai dealt harshly with Hagar to the point where Hagar ran away. But again, this is a part where the, the translated text is not enough. The language here is not just saying that Sarai was catty towards Hagar or she was a little mean. The word here for harshly is the same word for oppression that the writer of Exodus used to describe how the Egyptians treated the Hebrew slaves. Sarai oppressed Hagar. Sarai attempted to strip Hagar of any pride she may have gotten through this pregnancy and mentally, emotionally, verbally, and physically remind her where she belonged. Hagar couldn't do it anymore. She decided that the danger of the wilderness of Shur was better than a bed in the house of Sarai. And so just as my ancestors fled in the dark of the night from plantations, found the dangers of death on the run, they, were, they felt that they were better off dealing with the treachery of the wilderness than a pallet on the master's plantation. There are moments where we can no longer accept or take the abuse placed on us. We can no longer accept it because maybe, like Hagar, we got a taste of what it feels like to have self-worth. We got a taste of what it means to see ourselves as more than what those in power tell us that we are. Whoever those people in power are in our lives, and how they attempt to beat the self-worth out of us again and again. But oddly enough, the wilderness, with all of its danger, is transformed into a safe space, dare I say, a holy place for Hagar. She has this transformative experience with the divine in the wilderness. Although during that encounter, she was told to return to her position as a slave woman, which I personally take issue with and I cannot explain or begin to understand why the angel of the Lord would tell her to return. Maybe it's because of the fact that Ishmael would not have been named by his father and would not have been worthy of inheritance if she had stayed in the wilderness. Or maybe it's because God knew that the next time Hagar and her unborn son would be in the wilderness, it would be to inherit God's promise for her, 
whatever the reason God has for telling Hagar to return home to Sarai, what God does is promises her with similar language as the promise God made to Abram in the previous chapters that Hagar will be the mother, dare I say a matriarch, of multitudes, that her offspring will be too numerous to number. So within this larger narrative of a wealthy patriarch of faith, we have this lesser seen narrative of Mother Hagar, whose real name we don't even know. God through his messenger, or through this messenger, gives to Hagar the first annunciation of a promised son recorded in scripture. And Hagar, in that moment, in that encounter with God, becomes the only person in the canon of scripture to ever name God. Her encounter with God, her experience with God, led her to name God El Roy, the God who sees, and more personally for her, the God who sees me, the God who looks after me. She names the well that sustained her in the wilderness, the well of the living one who sees me. I must be honest that the first time I read this narrative and realized that the only person in scripture to name God is not just a woman, but a slave woman whose real name we don't even know, I was deeply moved. And I saw scripture in a way that I had never seen it before. I connected with Hagar in a way that I had never connected before. Because when I was reading scripture as a kid, I couldn't identify with Sarai. I was not a wealthy person. My family was not a wealthy family. And I couldn't identify with this idea of being the chosen and promised one. And then to see Hagar, a woman like me, a woman with slave ancestry, be seen not just as a slave, but be seen as a matriarch, be seen as someone who God visions and dreams for, that God is the one who sees us, that in a society like today, where Black women are sometimes considered the lowest of people, that Black women are unsupported and often feel as if they are in these fights for justice alone, that there is a divine that sees us and that hears us and that looks after us and that dreams for us. But even more so, because there is a divine that will dream for the most marginalized and oppressed in society, that same divine dreams for everyone else too. God does not only dream for Hagar, but not for Abram and Sarai. This is a, a narrative that shows us that God sees us all that God includes us all, that God dreams for us all, and that God hears us all. And when I think about that in the context of womanism and in the context of everything we are discussing today and everything our Q&A will discuss later, I am amazed and I am honored to know that the divine sees me and also sees my neighbor also sees my best friend, also sees my black gay male friend, also sees the lives of trans women who are taken, the over 32 trans women whose lives have been taken this year. God still sees the lives of those who are living comfortably during COVID. He sees the life, God sees the lives of those who are like the clients I work with and who are survivors of trafficking, who have lost their agency, who have lost their voice, who have had their needs ignored. God, the divine, he, she, it, they see us all and invite us all to see others. And through the lens of womanism, we can see that. The dominant narrative will have us only see those in power and privilege. But when we look at the text through a womanist lens and we ask the question, where are the women in this text? Who is speaking? Who has a voice? What does this text say 
to black women, that means something. And that is something that is so amazing. And I know this probably feels like it was a little rushed and, but I think this is one of, this is just an introduction. I encourage you all to read more, look up Womanist Midrash, look at the works of Alice Walker, look at the works of Monica Coleman and Kelly Brown Douglas and examine what womanism looks like. You know, examine what it looks like when you read the biblical text, not in the way it's been taught to us, but in a way that leaves room for everyone at the table. So I welcome you all to the table and I look forward to talking with you in the Q&A and exploring more about womanism. Thank you.